Um, uh, my name is Yaroslav and, and I'm an engineer at GoldSky. Uh, I used to work uh, at Shopify and Activision, primarily building different uh, data streaming uh, platforms. Um, and uh, my name is Yao Meng. I'm also an engineer at GoldSky. Uh, previously, I uh, work at Activision building data platform. Uh, so to start, uh, let us introduce GoldSky. Um, GoldSky is a real-time data platform, and we focused on blockchain data. So uh, GoldSky can ingest raw blockchain data as well as uh, a standard called subgraphs. So subgraphs, uh, we're not going to go too deep into it, but if you are dealing with blockchain data, um, you implement um, a piece of logic in TypeScript. You can define your GraphQL manifest and um, deploy it. Um, on a tool called GraphNode. And that tool will ingest data from uh, blockchain, process it the way you want, and serve it. And excuse me. Um, once you ingest the data, I don't know what's going on. Uh, once you ingest, ingest the data to GoldSky, you can transform it uh, using Flink SQL. This is what we uh, expose to our customers. And you can choose a database uh, to stream your results from those transformations, or you can stream just raw blockchain data. It's all powered by uh, Flink SQL and Red Panda internally. And so the use case that we want to explain today looks very simple. So GoldSky has a CLI uh, that allows you to deploy things like subgraphs and, and pipelines. And uh, you can see in the first command, we deploy a subgraph, very simple. Um, and then we deploy a pipeline that uses that subgraph as a source. Um, so this sounds very trivial, but we spent a lot of time building this uh, in a way that's uh, fully automated and fully self-serve. All right, um, let's dive in. Um, here is what our uh, architecture looks like. At the very left, uh, we have the data producer, and usually a decentralized application running on top of Ethereum version. Uh, running on top of Ethereum virtual machine, and uh, a user will specify uh, a GraphQL manifest to capture the event uh, of interest. And uh, this subgraph indexer, which is just a data indexer, will, oh, will index uh, those events into um, a Postgres database. And that's the first part uh, Slava showed earlier, uh, subgraph deploy. And as the second part, um, we have a Flink CDC pipeline, uh, which will capture those changes into Kafka-like system. Uh, in our case, we use Red Panda. And uh, um, notice that uh, for the GraphQL manifest, uh, a subgraph database a subgraph database will map to um, a database schema in Postgres, and each entity in the GraphQL definition will be mapped to uh, tables. And uh, one interesting in our platform is uh, we could have thousands of schemas. As users grow, as users deploy more subgraph, we'll have more and more uh, schema add to that tables, add to uh, the uh, schema. So uh, that's the overall structure, and uh, we, use, we use Link CDC to uh, capture those changes, dump data into, what? Uh, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, download that data into uh, Red Panda, and uh, our uh, any downstream uh, pipeline will, can, will consume that data, and um, they can choose any data sync they want. Um, before we go further, let's uh, do a quick recap of uh, how Postgres CDC works. Uh, for, for Postgres, um, any update uh, to the database will be written to uh, write a head log. And Postgres has this logical decoding mechanism, which will 
parse that writer had logged into a, a very readable uh, text format. Um, and that logical decoding format can be consumed by downstream consumers. And the position uh, in the writer had log is called the log sequence number. So basically that is a 64-bit offset. Uh, usually you will see that represented by a hexadecimal format. So with that, uh, we have uh, a very readable uh, logical decoding format. In our case, we use Flink CDC consumer to consume that logical decoding format. Uh, inside the Flink CDC consumer is actually embed uh, the Debezium engine to parse that event, uh, that uh, format into a, a standard change event format. Uh, the standard change event format is uh, a JSON format, uh, which is pretty simple. Uh, was, it will show what the data looks like before, uh, what the data looks like after, and the, um, some metadata associated with uh, the data, like uh, schema, uh, table, transaction ID, log sequence number. And uh, with that change event format, Flink can further process that and convert that to a Flink CDC, uh, convert that into a um, row in the Flink table. Um, inside the Postgres side, uh, there is a mechanism called the replication slot, which basically used to tracking the right to hate. Um, right, right ahead uh, format. Um, and one thing to notice is um, Postgres can't retain the right ahead log forever because otherwise it's kind of fill up the whole disk and uh, it will be a disaster. So um, Postgres has a garbage collection process which will decide when to get rid of the right head log. Uh, that one, part of that is design, uh, is uh, decided by replication slot. So when there is active consumed replication slot and there's some offset need to be used, um, we are need to keep that uh, right head log. So as you can see, um, the takeaway here is first, uh, you can't retain retro head log forever, so you won't get the full picture. And to get the full picture, you also need to get the current stage of the database. Uh, the second one is, it's very important to manage the life cycle of the replication slot, because otherwise, uh, the retro head logging space will be a big issue. And this comes to our platform requirement. Um, replication slot management is one thing. Uh, the next thing is now we need to consume two different parts of data. One is a snapshot. The second is a streaming part, right ahead logging. Um, we want the snapshot part be log free and uh, scalable. Uh, we want to log free because we don't want to stop the whole world when you're processing that data, right? And the second one is, um, usually the initial state could be large, so it takes a long time to do the slap short. And we want to have a way to parallelize that, so we want it scalable. Uh, the last one is a uh, uh, dynamic schema feature, like we will keep adding new table we want to capture could be every hour user want to capture new tables. So we want to have a scan newly added feature which won't interrupt the whole process. Um, first, let's uh, uh, talk about uh, replication slot management. Um, for Aurora, like RDS, uh, the default number of replication slot is 20, you can increase that. Um, the, 
for this one, we actually have two extreme cases. The first one, we just use one replication slot to manage all the tables. Um, the problem here is it will be hard to scale. It's basically, you use that to manage thousands of tables. Uh, the second one is uh, how about we use one slot per table or per job, and then you have thousands of uh, replication slot. You need to make sure the life cycle is managed properly. So that's an operation burden. Um, what we end up with uh, is something in the middle. Uh, we want a fixed number of replication slot. So in this example, let's say we only want three replication slot. And uh, to do that, we operate all those CDC ingesters as a whole clusters. Um, for every new table comes in, uh, we use a consistent hasher to assign the new table to one of that ingesters. And with that, we have a fixed number of ingesters uh, and a fixed number of replication slot. Uh, furthermore, if we want to scale up the ingester clusters uh, in the future, we can do that as well. So that's uh, completes the first part of our requirement, replication slot management. Uh, now there are two more parts. Uh, first, we want the log free and the parallel slab short. The second one, we want to scan newly add a feature, uh, scan newly add tables. Um, and luckily, uh, we resort to Flink CDC. Um, Flink CDC is a side project of Flink, and there's a very rich community. Um, it has a very feature-rich uh, MySQL connectors. It basically has this increment slab short and also scan newly add a feature. So can newly add a table feature. Um, last March, they based on the MySQL CDC connector, they abstract uh, incremental slab short framework. And uh, that framework provide a many uh, abstraction uh, to help you build the uh, incremental slab short connectors. So we start to explore that on uh, last October, and uh, over the time, community add a new connector based on that framework. Uh, we come at, uh, with uh, two PR, one is uh, CDC connectors, uh, the other is a uh, more fundamental one, we added, uh, put in the scan newly added tables to the CDC-based framework. Um, internally, we maintain a fork of the Flink CDC connectors, and we put that into production uh, this year, uh, in January. Uh, Slava will talk more about our production story in the second part. Um, so, uh, that's initially we uh, have that configuration. Still, there's some manual work handled by our engineers. And just this month, we release uh, a new uh, product. Basically, all those configuration and uh, manual process now is uh, self-serve. That's the uh, COI Slava showed very earlier. Uh, you just need two command. Uh, start from deploying uh, subgraph to streaming all those subgraph data and also there's some business logic handling so to stream any database the end user want. Um, we will keep adding new connectors, of course. Um, so from the Flink CDC community side, uh, we get the uh, CDC connector PR merge uh, in June, uh, release 2.4. And the scan newly added feature PR is planned for 2.5. So stand tuned for that one. Okay. Um, with that, uh, let's uh, take a look how you use Flink CDC. Uh, Flink CDC has two interfaces. Uh, the first is a SQL interface. 
Uh, the SQL interface is very good to track a single table. Um, it's pretty easy. You just have this uh, SQL statement. And to enable the incremental slab short feature, uh, you just add this uh, feature flag uh, to the end of this configuration. Uh, the second interface is the data stream interface. And that is quite useful when you want to track in multiple tables. And this is what we use in our platform. Okay. Now, um, I want to give a quick uh, high-level picture how does this work. We won't be able to cover all the details, um, but uh, overall, the CDC-based uh, framework is based on Flip 27, which is a quite elegant source interface from Flink. Um, the core idea is you can separate work discovery uh, from read source, uh, source reading. So in this case, uh, we have uh, two data source as a fair lab, like the snapshot and the right-hand login stream. And the, at the bottom, you can see there's a split enumerator, which used to track what the data we want to read from. And the source reader here it will track uh, those uh, snapshot and uh, right-hand uh, log stream and actually fetch that, data, uh, fetch that data. All the data will be put into a, a change event queue. And the uh, record emitter will uh, iterate over that queue and send the uh, uh, source record and eventually that will be deserialized into a Flink row data. Uh, so that's what it looks like for the overall uh, source interface. Um, let's zoom in a little bit, uh, talking about what the data looks like in this split. So we have two different types of data, uh, slab short and the stream part. Uh, for the slab short part, um, we have, uh, so basically we need to split the slab short into different chunk. Um, so we have the, what the split key looks like, and we will have the start, split start and the split end. Uh, what's interesting part is uh, there is also a high water mark. The reason of this um, is, remember we are talking about the slab short should be log free. So when you actually do the slab short, the data will keep coming in. And the high water mark will mark the position when the data, when you finish the slab short. So it will use to, uh, by the framework to do some reconcile. And the stream split is uh, pretty straightforward. You just need to get the position, which is the LSN in the right hand log. So you have the starting offset, ending offset. And eventually, uh, the framework will handle how to reconcile these two split and make sure we get an uh, ordered, uh, complete data set. Okay, so with that, we uh, finish the Postgres CDC connector. Um, the second part is uh, how about we want that scan newly added table feature. Uh, that part, actually, we won't have time to uh, cover that. Um, just wanted to show you uh, one diagram when we try to debugging that uh, asynchronous code. Um, it's not recommended. Uh, and basically, you have this uh, complicated state transition, and uh, um, it's a lot uh, of state transition to actually get into that. All right, um, so um, we get the CDC connector, and we added that scan newly table feature, and we thought our work is done. 
Yes, of course, as usual, it's never done. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, we implemented quite sophisticated system. We had tests running, everything worked. And then we tried deploying it in staging environment and things exploded. Um, so we noticed that um, when connector tried to use, uh, tr tried to perform snapshotting, he tried to use a replication slot that was already uh, used by the live stage, right? So the connector works, uh, it does, uh, it omits the replication slot for the right ahead log uh, data, uh, and uh, it's supposed to do uh, snapshotting just using, you know, select statements. But uh, for some reason, the snapshotting phase still uses a replication slot. So, so why is that? Um, the way uh, this incremental snapshotting uh, is designed, it's based on this paper from Netflix called DBLog. This is what Debezium and Flink CDC use, and the algorithm is quite sophisticated, it is watermarking, but if I try to really simplify it into this, you know, four simple steps, uh, you have this live event processing uh, uh, phase, which you stop, uh, you read the next chunk from the database, which can be like a few thousands of rows, uh, you process that, then you resume your live event processing, and then you try to reconcile those uh, two groups of events using watermarks, and you're not going to emit data that's already stale, for example, right? Because maybe you saw the update for a key uh, in the in the live phase. Um, and when we implemented the Postgres uh, connector, we just, you know, looked at the way MySQL worked and we kind of copied that design. Uh, and we noticed something interesting. So uh, there's this Postgres scan fetch task, which kind of orchestrates the whole um, snapshotting phase. And it can uh, create a snapshot split read task which reads that chunk of data uh, from, from the uh, database uh, when doing snapshotting. And then we noticed it can actually instantiate this Postgres stream fetch task, uh, which is doing backfilling, which, which is something we're gonna explain in a second. And then when it's done, it's doing another chunk, then again, backfilling, another chunk, backfilling, right? So it's kind of iterating. Um, and this is actually needed uh, in MySQL, at least to um, kind of catch up uh, on the live event processing, right? Because in that algorithm that I showed you, you pause or stop uh, processing the first step, right? So when you resume, you kind of want to catch up, like what did I miss in the log? And um, that's something that uh, is called backfilling um, in Flink CDC, and it works quite well in MySQL. But in Postgres, when you try to do it, um, again, because you are trying to read the live data, it wants to use a replication slot, but, but you can't. You can't really share that. Uh, replication slots in Postgres are designed in a way where you have one active consumer and that's it. If you try to use another consumer, um, uh, that that will just not work, right? It will fail with an exception. So um, when you think about that, uh, backfills are really hard to scale uh, if, you, if you try to implement them the same way uh, because you can't reuse those uh, slots between snapshot and live modes. Also, when you're doing uh, like large uh, backfills, you're using parallelism more than one uh, on the snapshotting. So you have like multiple concurrent uh, tasks doing snapshotting and each of them will try to obtain this replication slot for backfilling so it can catch up. And finally, it's just really slow because for every backfill, you have to seek to a certain LSN position in the right ahead log. And that seeking uh, in our environment, it took you know seconds or even tens of seconds. And that means after you read a chunk of data, you'll have to pause for you know, like 10 seconds and that's just killing, killing the throughput, right? It's, it's really, really slow. Um, and you, know, you can maybe uh, come up with a strategy where you create a backfill uh, slot uh, per task and then you maybe delete it, right? But in this case, while it's still very slow, you still have to do that seeking, uh, you can end up with just too many slots, right? So that uh, number uh, 20 uh, is a standard uh, limit and you can increase it uh, it will affect your performance eventually, right? You can't just keep increasing that number forever. And also you need to think about the life cycle, like when do I delete the slot when it's done? And that can be very brittle for large snapshots because you must delete all the slots or you, not, you need to make sure you don't have any slot that's not consumed because if you do that, you see that on, on the uh, RDS uh, monitoring page. Um, so this is a very different from Kafka, right? So in Kafka, you have offsets stored for a topic, uh, for, for, a, for a consumer group, for a topic. And if you have retention on that topic, uh, it's possible that the offsets that you stored, they no longer exist, right? Because retention kicked off, data's gone. Postgres, on the other hand, is very, it's trying to be very helpful. So if you have a replication slot open, which is kind of like a consumer, uh, it will just keep accumulating that transactional log uh, forever, 
right? Because it thinks, well, you open the slot, you, you need the data, you shouldn't miss it, right? So it's very easy to, um, you know, uh, end up in a situation where you just keep growing that storage. And even though RDS claims we have infinite uh, disks, right? Uh, you will hit issues eventually, right? And maybe sooner than, than you think. So uh, that can be very problematic. So that's one more reason to not create as many slots as possible, right? And we thought, well, maybe we can uh, re-implement this backfilling functionality uh, using Flink, right? So what if we just don't perform any backfills and we use some building blocks that Flink provides uh, to re-implement some of this uh, backfilling functionality? And so uh, we came up with this approach where we have two sort of physical Postgres sources. Uh, one is in the snapshot mode and one is in the live mode, right? So they are configured differently. They essentially process the same data. They have the same input table set. Um, and we have a stateful reconciliation step uh, implemented as a Flink uh, operation uh, that sort of combines the data together and reconciles it. Uh, this is what it looks uh, from the code base, um, kind of very, very simplified. Uh, if you can read this, uh, we have uh, two data stream sources defined at the beginning. Uh, the live stream source has parallelism of one. Uh, because that's kind of how how many you know uh, threads you can you can use when you're reading uh, from a replication slot really, um, and uh, performing some um, uh, transformations. And in the end, last four lines, we are doing a, a union of those two streams with a key by using a primary key value, and finally that reconciliation step. Uh, and the reconciliation looks like this. It's a flat map operation, so it may emit you know zero, one, or many records. Um, we, first of all, detect if the record we're currently seeing is from the snapshot data or not. And you can do it by checking the uh, Debezium uh, header, uh, the operation um, header. And if it's uh, live data, uh, then we know we can always emit it, right? Because it's supposed to be fresh, it's not supposed to be stale. And we uh, persist. Uh, this uh, Boolean flag seen in live stream uh, in Flink state. So we know that uh, for this primary key, we already saw something in the live uh, phase. And if it's actually snapshot data we're processing, we first check, have we seen something before in the live stream? If yes, we simply don't emit the data anymore. Um, and uh, if, if it's a brand new primary key, it's definitely safe to emit. And just to illustrate it, uh, a couple of examples. Uh, so for the first primary key, let's say we get an insert and then we get an update from the live phase. Uh, again, totally fine to emit them. They're supposed to be uh, ordered. Um, in the second uh, scenario, we first get the update from the live stream phase. Uh, at that point, we will set that Boolean flag to true. And then if we get a read, um, which is a snapshot uh, record later, we simply ignore it. And it's actually pretty, uh, you know, okay to get it uh, later because uh, when you're reading from, for example, from Postgres and you're performing some kind of uh, select star from uh, statement, it doesn't actually guarantee any kind of order, uh, right? So data can come out of order. And it's quite possible that, you know, you're backfilling data from, you know, months ago and you now see something in the live stream because, you know, transaction was just performed. And if later you get another update, that's perfectly fine, just submit it. And the ideal scenario where, uh, in the third case, we get first data from the snapshot, emit it, and then start getting data from the uh, live stream. And this is what the Flink UI looks like. Um, as you can see, parallelism of one for the uh, live uh, uh, source, and uh, we increase parallelism to four for the uh, snapshot in, for, in this case. Uh, and then we have reconciliation step and we emit data to Kafka uh, using a Kafka sync. So um, as a result, uh, we now have this uh, fully uh, self-serve kind of customer driven platform uh, where customers, they don't need to know about Kafka or Kafka Connect or Debezium or CDC or data pipelines or Postgres application slots. Uh, they don't really know about any of that. They just care about the data that they want. Um, and uh, subgraphs, even though you know you you know that you know probably uses Postgres internally, you don't really deal with it uh, from the customer facing side. And currently, I just checked, we are ingesting more than uh, 450 tables from a variety of different schemas, uh, and our end-to-end latency from uh, Postgres ingestion to when we emit data to Kafka is under three seconds. 
Uh, some of the key takeaways, um, maintaining replication slot can be tricky, as I showed you with that example, with a graph. Uh, you really need to have good monitoring, alerting runbooks to understand when you hit that situation where for some reason slot has not been actively consumed. Uh, you can use techniques like consistent hashing for managing a pool of resources that's, you know, uh, maybe uh, very tricky to, to scale, like you want to keep, keep things uh, consistent. Uh, and uh, Flink has a lot of building blocks, low-level building blocks, like state and timers, that allow you to uh, customize those different workloads. So you can have your own flavor of incremental snapshotting, or your own flavor of uh, streaming joins, or your own flavor of you know, event processing. Uh, we have some links in case you want to check them later. Um, and I think we have some time for some bonus content. So um, we faced this interesting uh, situation where uh, we had different Postgres databases uh, being ingested. And one of, the, one of those databases, uh, you know, for customer C in this case, it didn't receive many writes. So it says no writes, but let's say no writes in a day or in a week, right? And uh, both uh, Debezium and Flink CDC, they, they, they kind of re rely on some writes to happen in order to extract the current LSN position and some other metadata and to, to uh, you know, make sure they can progress, right? So if there are no writes, no activity happening in the database, you're not getting anything, and you can't really understand like what, what's going on, I don't see any LSN progressing, am I stuck, right? And so we learn about this very cool trick where in Postgres, uh, there's this function called PG, a logical emit message, which allows you to emit a message right to the write ahead log directly. Uh, and sounds really cool and scary, uh, but it's actually perfectly safe to do it. Uh, it has um, uh, a transactional indicator, the first argument, and then prefix and the payload that you sent to the write ahead log. And uh, you know both Debezium and Flink CDC because they know that you know this is not the format kind of they expect. They'll gladly uh, you know skip this message. They're not going to use it for processing, but they will use it to uh, extract all the metadata they need, like current OSNs. Make some progress. So wanted to share this. It's a very cool. Thing.